I say, it's all a big lie. Sure it is, Mr. O'Brien. As big a lie as the fact that Tammany knew back. The appeal to O'Brien's fierce Irish pride bore fruit much sooner than Jones had dared to hope. Within an hour of the conversation in the bar, Sheriff James O'Brien was in the home of his cousin, Matthew O'Rourke. Not much is known about the pressures which O'Brien was able to put on the new county auditor. But by the end of his meeting with O'Brien, O'Rourke had reluctantly agreed to make copies of the private records of Boss Tweed's infamous board of audit. But once started, O'Brien was not content with having opened a single hole in the Tammany Dyke. There were others who owed him favors from his days of power. How are things going, William? Oh, fine, Sheriff. Couldn't be better, thanks to you. Do you come here often, lad? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I do. I'm really on my best behavior these days. I'm glad to hear it. That uh, could have been a nasty business last year. Yes, sir. And I can't thank you enough for getting me off and then finding me this job. For your wife and the little ones. That's who I did it for. Keep up the good work, Bill. Keep it up. Oh, I will, sir. I will. I promise. You know, the county auditor's office is a mighty important place to work. Oh, it is, sir. It is, and I know it. I've been wondering. Wondering if you're ready for a very difficult and delicate job. On May 31st, 1871, when his daughter Mary Amelia was married at Trinity Chapel, Bill Tweed was one of the happiest men in New York. Oh, the Tribune's got a nerve. I got half a mind to call Horace Greeley up here and give him what for. Why, Bill? They're reporting the event most respectfully, I thought. Yeah, but did he have to say that the kids got $700,000 worth of wedding gifts? Isn't that what they're worth? Well, of course it is, but it doesn't look good in print, Dick. That's the first time I've ever heard you worry about appearances, Senator. Yeah, Mr. Jones, I am delighted you could accept our invitation. I didn't. You forgot to invite me. But as a member of the press, I'm anxious to get your reaction to a certain piece of news. Oh, uh, good news, uh, Mr. Jones? That's what I've come here to find out. With all these festivities, I wonder if you're aware, Senator, that at 2.30 p.m. today, exactly uh, 38 minutes ago, the treasurer of the City Board of Audit, Matthew O'Rourke, resigned. Well, 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 James, how's yourself? Oh, this is a surprise, all right. I thought we agreed not to meet because of the risk. Oh, yeah, there's no risk at all, not now. Sit down and take your ease. No risk? What do you mean? Well, I mean, I, uh, I just resigned today. I just after lunch. Huh, have a cup of tea, James. Mother makes lovely strong tea. Look at that, a mouse could dance on that. You resigned. <laughs> then, then you've got it all. <laughs> ah, I've got plenty, James. Oh, that's grand. Grand! <laughs> you were planning to go to Boss Street and ask him for some money, weren't you? That I was. Money what's owed me. Well, how much were you going to ask for? I said, what's owed me? 350000 by my reckoning. Well, I think your uh, reckoning's a bit low. Oh? I think you're entitled to half a million. Half a million? 
Well, sure, you know yourself that those thieves started by taking 66 and two-thirds percent. They moved that up to 85, and now they're taking 94 cents out of every dollar that's spent by the city of New York. So I think half a million's a very conservative figure, James. Oh, you've done a capital job, Matt. <laughs> you think so, Jim? I'm the first to give credit where credit is due. Ah, thanks very much, Jim. Credit's a lovely thing, but you can't spend it. Half a million's a fine fat pie. And I was sort of hoping that... Uh... Oh, say no more, Matt. I've had it in the back of my mind right from the first. <laughs> I knew you did, Jim. I knew you did. And since Mother and I are thinking about an ocean voyage, I was wondering if he'd let me have my share by the end of the month. Quarter of a million, Jim. What? A quarter of a million. So that's only half of what you're getting yourself. Why, you... You bog-trotting thief, you! Thief, am I? And I suppose you consider yourself a philanthropist. $250,000, O'Brien. I'll go elsewhere for your figures. And I will go elsewhere, Matthew O'Rourke. And you, you can go to the old Nick himself and take your papers with you. Put them here for safekeeping, although you really can't keep anything safe when there are so many little ones about. Oh, here they are. Well, yes. You'll have to forgive the handwriting. I had to write them so fast. Oh, oh, they're lovely, William. Simply lovely. And your handwriting's not bad at all, boy. Are they what you wanted? Oh, just what I wanted. Just exactly. Uh, you won't forget what I've done for you, will you, Sheriff? Oh, not if I live another hundred years. You know, William, you're going to be an important man one day. You've got the look about you of a man who is on his way. Yes, sir, a man who is on his way. I'll be in touch with you. Well, here I am. What's so important? I'd uh, like you to look at these papers, Bill. What is it? Right out of the county auditor's private books. True copies. So? So, for one thing, they prove that the organization owes me more than $350,000. But I'm not a greedy man. I will settle for what I asked for in the past. Oh, you... you will, eh? So that's the offer, is it? Well, I wouldn't want anyone to see these papers but you, Bill. Look at them. I don't have to look at them. I know what's in our books. Yes, but does the public? Oh, we wouldn't want them to know now, would we? <laughs> Who cares? Well, the newspapers might. You're a bad salesman, O'Brien. You are selling something for which there is only one customer, me. And if I don't buy them, why, you can take those papers and sew them into a flag and fly them down Broadway for all the good it'll do you. I am not interested in those papers. I wouldn't give you a dime for them. Now get out of here. Dick, I want O'Brien followed wherever he goes. And O'Rourke? I do not wish to see that man's face again, as long as I live. O'Brien attempted to peddle his information to the New York Sun, only to learn that Matthew O'Rourke had attempted the same thing earlier. The Sun was not interested. They offered them both exactly nothing.
the papers with him. You're sure of that? I'm positive. That means the son wouldn't touch them. He's an idiot to think they would. They've supported Tweed ever since the beginning. It's incredible. We've been after those papers for 15 months, and now not one, but two men are trying to peddle them all over town. Sooner or later, one of them's bound to show up right here. If they live that long. Wilson, get back on O'Brien's trail. Don't let him out of your sight. I want those figures on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow morning. <laughs> Hot enough for you? How about some cold beer? just come in sitting by the door there. Do you know them? I've seen them around. They'd shoot you full of holes for the price of a beer. Mr. O'Brien. What? Oh. Wilson Ford of the New York Times. What do you want? Oh, nothing in particular. Just to talk to you. Help you if I can. Look. Those two hard hats sitting over there by the door, I don't think they'd appreciate my talking to anybody from the New York Times. Don't look over there. If you really want to help me, get away from me. Well, that's where you're wrong, Mr. O'Brien. I'd say you were safe just as long as you and I stay together. Not a second longer. I mean, whatever they plan to do to you, they wouldn't want it witnessed by a reporter from the New York Times, now would they? Then there's another consideration. With those papers bulging in your pocket, I'd say your life's worth just about two cents. Maybe less. And on the other hand, once you've turned them over to the New York Times, you're as safe as you can be. And then, if anything happens to you, Sheriff, We'd make sure everybody knew who did it and why. And you know yourself, Sheriff, that Senator Tweed wouldn't fancy a murder charge. Well, not at this particular time. Thanks for the drink. It's been a pleasure. Good luck, Sheriff. Wait. this piece of paper, I'm going to write down my rock-bottom price. And on that one, you put down your absolute top offer. We'll split the difference. Fair enough? The New York Times doesn't buy its news. It finds it. Besides, what you're offering for sale is stolen property. Those papers are part of the public record. They belong to the people of New York, and we propose to return them to the people of New York. I should have known better than to try and do business with a Republican. Sheriff. Sure. There are those two men still downstairs. Who will have no way of knowing that you haven't given us those papers. I don't believe they'll pause to ask. You uh, will be giving me the chance to stay around up here for a while, no? Over $200,000 of rent for an armory they never use. Look at this. $84,000 a month for repairs to the armory they've never even used. Andy Garvey, again and again. This man's not a plasterer, he's a prince of plasterers. The chairs. $203,620 for chairs for the courthouse. There isn't over 70 chairs in that building. Someone here to see you, George, from downtown. Tammany, again? Mm -hmm. Throw him out. I think you might want to talk to this one, George. I said throw him. That's... 
Mr. Jones, he heard what you said, but that's hardly a, a tactful way to talk about an old friend, huh? After all, the Times has visited me on so many occasions without warning that I thought it's only fair that I <laughs> return the compliment. Well, I can't say that we're honored, Senator, but we're certainly surprised. I had uh, hoped that we could have a little chat, uh, man to man. Man to man, Senator. The floor is yours. Mr. Jones, I like you. You know, it's a pity we're on opposite sides of the fence. Well, Senator, what's a man to do? Life is full of these little disappointments. <laughs> Mr. Jones, you have in your possession certain documents. Now, 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 we won't argue about how you got them or when or from whom, but suffice it to say that you have them and we want them. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. <laughs> uh, tell me, you are an employee here, aren't you? I mean, you don't, uh, you don't own this paper. No, I don't own it. That is a conscientious newspaper man. It must have occurred to you how pleasant it would be to, uh, well, to own the paper that you edited so that you could print the news just as you wanted to print it. It uh, has occurred to me, yes. Well, how much do you think it would cost to uh, buy the New York Times, Mr. Jones? A million dollars? The Times is a big enterprise, Mr. Tweed. I'd say closer to two million. Well, or, or, but if you had two million dollars and you spent it all on the paper, then you wouldn't have any pocket money. Hmm. True, Senator, very true. But on the other hand, if a man had three million dollars, then he could buy the paper and be comfortable the rest of his life. A breathtaking prospect. Uh, do you think that if a man owned his own paper and had all that ready cash besides, uh, that he would find it necessary to print things that embarrassed his friends? No, I don't think such a man would. In that case, Mr. Jones, I think we can safely say that by tomorrow, you are going to own this paper. I am so glad to see that we could reach an understanding. Mr. Tweed. Yeah? Perhaps I'm selling myself a little short. Is it possible you'd pay even more for my silence? Say, uh, five million? F That's a great deal of money to me, Senator. But what can it be to an organization that has already stolen over 200 million from the city? Mr. Jones, your charm is beginning to wear quite thin. All right, five million. But you must return those figures to us and give me your word of honor that you will never mention this episode again. Are we agreed? Senator, I'm stunned. I don't suppose the devil will ever bid a higher price for me. But the answer is no. No, we are not agreed. It was no a year ago, it is no now, and it will always be no. Jones, you're a tin-plated fool. Look here, if you don't accept that money now, you'll regret it the rest of your life. Sure, sure, you'll get a scoop, all right, and you'll be a big hero for as much as a month. But 10 years from now, who'll remember? Who'll care? I will, Senator, and so will you wherever you are.
On Saturday, July 22nd, 1871, George Jones broke the Tammany story across the front page of his paper. A three-column headline, the first such headline in the history of the New York Times. For a while, Tweed and his gang tried to brazen it out. Honest and intelligent persons will not believe what the Times has charged upon the city government. Lies, gentlemen, all lies. Are those charges true, Senator Tweed? Suppose they are. What are you gonna do about it? It took three months and an outraged public opinion to get Tweed indicted. Another 15 months before he stood trial. By this time, his associates in the ring had, without exception, either turned state's evidence or fled to Europe. Tweed himself faced a total of 220 counts. We find the defendant, William Marcy Tweed, guilty on counts one through 204, and not guilty on counts 205 through 220. This made Tweed liable to a sentence totaling 102 years in prison and a fine of $25,000. William Marcy Tweed, I hereby sentence you to 12 years imprisonment and a fine of $12,750. <laughs> On April 12, 1878, eight days after his 55th birthday, and at the last stroke of noon from the bell in the Essex Market Tower, William Marcy Tweed, the man who stole New York City, died in the debtor's cell of Ludlow Prison. Destroyed by a press which he despised, through the courage of a man whom he had never been able to intimidate or corrupt. Before previewing next week's great adventure, here is Gerald Goff, a teacher and a member of the National Education Association, with a postscript on tonight's story. This isn't really a scene from Roman history. Cartoonist Thomas Nast drew it about Boss Tweed, a Roman emperor with the Tammany Tiger, and Tweed's own words as the caption, what are you going to do about it? Perhaps William Marcy Tweed deserves a place in history for those words alone. What are you going to do about it? Only when the people have the facts, only when they take the trouble to learn how their government operates are they ready for action against the boss tweeds, wherever they may appear. The vote is a right of American citizens. We also have the high duty of becoming informed. The action that we take then becomes the answer to boss tweed. What are you going to do about it? Here are a few scenes from our next episode of The Great Adventure. Get out, Salon! Come help with that battering ram! Rally around the ram! Now you go over to Major Crawford. Tell him to take his men south to the river. The British will retreat that way. I'll keep up the pressure here. Tell him to get to the rear of them and cut him off. We'll take the entire command. Now hurry on. Now, young soldiers, you will show us the shortest route to the Thompson farm. Thompson? We have reason to believe Major Crawford is hiding there. We don't know any Thompson, sir. This is the last and hardest lesson a boy learns. That in the end, he must stand alone. It sustained him half a century later when Andrew Jackson was elected seventh president of the United States.